this podcast, you'll find interviews with high-performing, successful individuals in life sciences. On a weekly basis, we cover their proven methods, principles, strategies, and mindsets to implement new technologies that scale to meet the needs of people in our world. Welcome to this episode of Life Science Success. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Don and I'm a digital marketer. And before we get into today's episode, I just wanted to play a quick message from our sponsor. This episode of Life Science Success is brought to you by D3 Digital Media Marketing. Dive into the digital world with confidence and creativity on your side. D3 Digital Media Marketing is your all-in-one solution for making a lasting impact online. From the vibrant, engaging world of social media marketing, podcasts and webinars to the strategic depths of website development, SEO, pay-per-click, email, and content marketing. We tailor our approach to fit your unique brand story. Let's elevate your presence, connect with your audience, and drive success together. Your digital journey starts here. Visit d3digitalmedia.com to learn more. In this episode of Life Science Success, we get we dive deep with Dr. John Lamatina, former president of Pfizer Global R and D, current biotech industry leader, from groundbreaking drug discoveries to shaping the future of pharmaceuticals. Dr. Lamatina is going to share with us his journey from the lab to the boardroom. So, welcome. Oh, thanks, Don. Thanks for having me. It's a pleasure. Yeah, it's great to have you on. I really appreciate it. And uh, can you just maybe just take a little little bit of time and tell us a little bit about your journey from being a medicinal chemist to becoming the president of, of Pfizer Global R&D? Uh, well, I'll try and, and, and cons- condense 30 years into, into one minute or so. Uh, I'm, as you mentioned, I'm trained as a chemist. Uh, I Came to the Pfizer Research Labs in Groton, Connecticut, back in uh, 1977, uh, and I started as a, a bench scientist, uh, as a medicinal chemist. And about every three years or so, uh, I was fortunate enough to, to get a promotion and, and have my job grow. Uh, and, and I'll highlight that the biggest ones, I guess, in the late 90s, I became the head of discovery research and in Groton, uh, which was a, a bit of a challenge and, and a thrill because I was responsible for all the uh, projects going from idea through to uh, getting a compound into development. Uh, then, though, in 1999, I was given a really a different position. I was put in charge of all development, which was basically the clinical research and all the drug development aspect, which was a, a big stretch, but it, it might have been uh, some of the most rewarding experiences I had uh, getting exposed to other, another side of the business. And then a few years later, based on my discovery and development experience, uh, Pfizer put me in charge of global R&D, which at the time uh, was pretty big. This was before Pfizer uh, condensed R&D operations quite a bit. But we had labs in those days running from uh, the United States, uh, Connecticut, Michigan, uh, St. Louis through uh, London, England and France and through to Japan. So uh, the sun never set on Pfizer R&D in those days. So it was a great job, very rewarding. Uh, I got to work with some tremendous scientists. And uh, when we were successful uh, and we actually got a drug approved, uh, it was a wonderful experience. Yeah, I'll bet. I'll, I, would, I could only imagine, you know, throughout all of that time, that there had to have been, you know, some some great challenges as well that that were probably learning experiences. Also, um, could you tell us about, you know, anything that that you know was significant that you felt like you took away from the experience that you had at Pfizer? Well, uh, I, I I'll give you a negative example, uh, but one that was uh, unfortunately uh, left a real big impression. That was a, a compound called torcetrapid. We uh, were, were really leaders in cardiovascular research at the time. We had Lipitor, which was uh, at the time the biggest selling drug uh, in the industry. And we were then looking for the next improvement in cardiovascular health. And at the time, it was believed that if you raised so-called good cholesterol, HDL, that you would have a more profound influence on uh, reducing heart attacks and strokes. And we developed a compound, which became Torsetrapid, which uh, worked wonderfully. In fact, other companies started chasing us. 
uh, and we started a, a and the comp- compound was terrific. When we combined it with Lipitor, you had a complete remodeling of of somebody's lipoprotein profile. I, I don't know how well the audience knows what their lipids should be, uh, but basically, uh, you ended up having far more good cholesterol than bad cholesterol. The, the LDL numbers were down in the 70s or 80s, and the HDL numbers were on the order of 100. And we launched a major billion-dollar clinical trial because the FDA wasn't going to approve this just based on raising good cholesterol. They want to say, okay, this this is what happens, but what is the actual benefit to patients? And it turned out that uh, the compound didn't work, that despite the raising of, of good cholesterol, uh, you you uh, had no real impact, uh, uh, beneficial impact on reducing heart attacks and strokes. And so we had to end the program. And it taught me a few things. Number one, just because you have an interesting biochemical effect doesn't mean to say you're going to have a, a beneficial effect medically. Uh, and it also taught you that no matter how good things look, things look, things look tremendous in phase two, the compound looked pretty safe, uh, that uh, you, you, you never know what's going to happen. And you're not, the, the old Yogi Bear is saying, it's not over till it's over. It's not over until the FDA approves your drug. So uh, that had an impact on me and, and, and points of portfolio balancing and things like that. So it's not a, a positive uh, story, but one that made a pretty big impression on me and also at, at our company. Yeah, I, th- I would, I would, could only imagine so. And, uh, and I also think though, too, that out of all of the times that I've asked a similar question, um, you know, oftentimes people tell, you know, very closely positive stories, right? <clears throat> um, and, and learnings from it. So, I mean, oftentimes we do learn a lot from, you know, when, when things don't go right. And so, you know, thank you for sharing that. I appreciate it. And let me make one more addition. And that is that, unfortunately, we spent a lot of money in a decade of research uh, showing to the world that raising good cholesterol, the so-called good cholesterol, didn't really impact heart disease. So this had a major impact on on uh, how to treat heart disease and, and lipid abnormalities. Uh, and and it's something that that people don't appreciate. That the major thing I think that the uh, drug industry does, that the biopharma industry does, is it proves or disproves medical hypotheses. In this case, we disprove the hypothesis that raising good cholesterol would be beneficial. Uh, it was a costly experiment, I would say, uh, but nevertheless, it, 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 it was important. And the industry never really gets credit uh, for things like that. And the same thing happened, uh, I'll digress for a second, with the mRNA vaccines. Before uh, Pfizer and Moderna came up with, with the life-saving and, and pandemic-relieving uh, mRNA vaccines, nobody knew if an MR, mRNA had any therapeutic uses at all. And it took... Uh, Unfortunately, a pandemic, but also uh, two companies investing a lot of time and money into uh, coming up with something that ended up saving the world. So before that, mRNA was sort of a cur- not quite a curiosity, but people weren't sure what it'd be good for. And again, the industry stepped up and, and in doing so, that's a positive case and in doing so, saved the world. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And uh, th- th- thank goodness for all of the, the groundbreaking, you know, research, but also all of the work it seemed like that, that we had done beforehand in Africa and other places seemed to, to have a, a definite positive effect overall in, in where we wound up as well. So, yeah, for sure. Yeah. That, I mean, it's a great lead in for my next question, which really is, you know, how's your experience, you know, with big pharma, you know, helped you, you know, with the, the biotech companies that you worked on uh, since uh, leaving Pfizer? So uh, I've, I've worked with a number of biotech companies since that time. Uh, and, and it's been very rewarding in a number of ways. Number one, uh, you know, I have a pretty, you know, 30 years of experience in drug develop- discovery and development. And so there are a lot of learnings I could share as a, as a board member or scientific advisor to these smaller companies. And, and I think uh, that experience is valued. Uh, and, and also I can advise people on where regulatory agencies, might, how they might look at programs and, and what kind of pitfalls you can have. So from that point of view, I think I can contribute a lot and I do contribute a lot to uh, their efforts and going forward. For me, it has kept me really on the cutting edge of science because a lot of these companies are are, are doing things that are uh, 
on on the edge of what a big pharma would do. I'll give one example. Uh, uh, I'm, I'm with Pure Tech Health, and, and we uh, started a program uh, in the microbiome space. And, and the theory being that the, the microbiome irregularities could be the foundation and cause of a variety of diseases. And uh, at the time, uh, if, I had, if I was working at Pfizer in those days, we wouldn't have started a microbiome company because it would have been too speculative. Uh, you know, where's it going to go? What therapeutic area would we use it for, et cetera. But a company like Vedanta, which is still private, but is now has compounds in, in phase two and phase three, uh, they, they uh, could have, with venture capital investment, uh, which is always very important, uh, can, can do that kind of uh, cutting edge speculative research that a big company wouldn't do. Not that a big company doesn't care about that, but rather they have other priorities and other things. And they, uh, at a place like Pfizer, we would wait to see if any uh, thing came out of the microbiome and then would invest in, in those companies. So, so it's been very rewarding for me to keep on, on cutting edge of science, to work with really bright uh, young scientists who put up with uh, sort of an old guy like me. And uh, it, it's a lot of fun to keep engaged and to try and help things. Yeah, I think it's, uh, I think it's funny that you say that because I, I, I'm, I'm, in a similar category, I feel like there are a lot of people that that I work with that you know sort of, you know, listen to the lessons that I've learned uh, throughout time, and they're like, you know, look, that's not going to happen here. And next thing you know, the signs start showing that you know, hey, look, we're following the same exact path that's going to lead us to the, you know, the end result that I've seen before. And so, um, yeah, yeah, it is. It is. It is interesting to be the grumpy guy in the room. <laughs> I, I fit that profile well. Yeah, me too. Me too. So I, I guess, can you explain a little bit? And I, I feel like you just touched on it s- somewhat, but could you could you explain a little bit about Pure Tech Health's approach to developing new classes of medicine and how it differs from traditional pharmaceutical research? Sure. So Pure Tech itself is a relatively small operation. You only have about 60 or 70 uh, full-time employees. What Pure Tech does beautifully, I'm going to use a specific example, is to come up with ideas uh, that are unique uh, to go after important diseases. So probably about 11 years ago, 12 years ago or so, uh, a couple of people at PureTech, Eric Alenko and Andrew Miller, uh, were looking for new ways to treat schizophrenia. And they, they ran across an old compound from Eli Lilly, uh, which uh, had done pretty well. In, it was a muscarinic agonist and had done pretty well in terms of treating uh, uh, schizophrenia, but it was plagued by muscarinic side effects. And so they dropped the compound. Uh, uh, Eric and and Andrew, what they thought was, well, you know, there are anti-muscarinics out there that act peripherally. Maybe we can uh, develop a combination drug that would maintain the uh, anti-schizophrenic activity of the Lilly compound, but yet uh, d- d- down, uh, downplay the, uh, uh, the uh, 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 muscarinic uh, uh, GI and other effects. So I uh, went to Lilly, uh, got a license to, uh, to the compound. We uh, uh, then uh, virtually uh, ran, uh, got formulations, got material made, got formulations, and again, ran, ran the clinical studies, and it worked, and it worked pretty well. It worked so well that Pure Tech uh, spun the, co- uh, the compound out into a company called Karuna. And then Karuna raised funds uh, independently uh, by investors, again, venture capitalists. And uh, eventually, as the compound showed that it worked in phase three, uh, Karuna, the company, was bought by uh, Bristol Myers for about $12 billion. Uh, that is probably our biggest success. Uh, but meaningful one because you know, it, it, people came up with uh, the, the pure tech folks came up with uh, important and the first new medicine uh, for schizophrenia in three decades or so. So it's a great example of what we've done. I've talked about Vedanta, at a microbiome company. We also formed a, a company called Achille, which developed uh, video game uh, technology to treat uh, uh, ADHD and, and cognition issues. So, and, and Pure Tech now has just spun out another company called Seacoast, uh, uh, Seaport Pharmaceuticals, uh, that is, is, is private at this stage, but developing various treatments for other CNS diseases. So, uh, it's a small operation, but an amazing track record uh, over the years. And I, I should give a shout out to uh, the founder, Daphne Zohar, who literally started this company probably 
about 18 years ago or so in a small office in, in uh, Brighton, Massachusetts, I think, just outside of Boston with uh, uh, Ben Shapiro and a couple of other people who were uh, industry uh, heads who uh, had retired from places like Merck or whatever. And uh, it's it's done remarkably well. So it's, uh, it's, it's a lot of fun to be a part of and, and to see the success that these people have had. Yeah, absolutely. And, uh, and I mean, it sounds to me like, um, like the, you know, they not, they're not only working on, you know, groundbreaking things, but they're also, you know, helping to, to bolster the industry as a whole, you know, by creating these additional companies, um, and spinning them out so that, I mean, that's a great, uh, you know, great attribute as well. Very much so. So that's been, it's been terrific to be a part of all this. Yeah, absolutely. So you're also an author, um, and you know, tell me a little bit about you know what you what you write about, and and you know what are some of the the things that you're looking to aim to address. So uh, when I the last few years at Pfizer, uh, the, the reputation of the industry was was getting battered, and and there was a lot of I thought misinformation out there. And so uh, the first thing I did when I left Pfizer, literally uh, in the first. Uh, year was to write a book called Drug Truths, the, the spelling, uh, the, the uh, bad image of, of pharmaceutical R&D. Uh, and what was rewarding about that was uh, I, I wrote about all sorts of things. You know, the industry is, uh, I'll give one example. You know, people say, well, the industry is only interested in Me Too drugs. They don't do anything original, which wasn't true. And I, each chapter, I addressed one of these things. But then I would tell the story of a drug that showed the innovation of the industry. So uh, with that one, nothing original, I talked about uh, a, an AIDS drug that we came up with at Pfizer uh, called Cell Century, uh, which was which is a, pr a pretty important uh, AIDS drug at the time. Uh, but I also talked about you know, the, the, a Me Too drug is such a, a misnomer. So, you know, you and I, Don, look, look so, somewhat alike. I mean, it's, it's, white middle-aged males or, or whatever, but I can guarantee you that there are drugs that I can take with no problem that, that may have an adverse effect on you. And that's true for any drug. Every, every drug has certain effects. And, and a drug like Lipitor, which is, is now in a generic form, is the third most prescribed drug in the United States as a torvastatin. Uh, I know people who take it and get headaches or, or get GI distress or whatever. So it, you need to have multiple uh, agents in the category uh, even though you might have one successful one, there are other uh, compounds that compound might not work for other people. So that's one reason. Second reason for having other alternatives is pricing. You, If you have multiple agents in a certain therapeutic class, the price will always come down because insurance companies will will bid you down to say, well, if you want this on our formulary, you've got to come down for price. So that kind of research is, is very important. And the other thing is nobody sets out to come up with a, 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 a Me Too drug uh, after the fact. So it's, you know, it's sort of like you don't sit around and say, well, Merck just had this great compound. Why don't we get ourselves one? Because it's Merck is selling a, a billion dollars a year with it. Well, if you start a program that late, you'll never, by the time you get in the market, there, there'll be generic uh, entries. So you won't, it won't be successful at all. What happens normally is that people will uh, uh, start programs. You know, we read the same literature. We go to the same scientific meetings. Uh, ideas will foment and, 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 and grow into programs. And some people are more successful more rapidly and others are not. So anyway, uh, uh, Drug Truths uh, was set out uh, to do that. Now, uh, that got me a, a lot of uh, places to, to give lectures and to talk about this. And, and the invariably now what will happen is people will say to me, I never heard, knew that. I never heard that. So that was rewarding, but it's sort of not big audiences. So then I, I got a, an invitation, however, to be on the Dr. Oz show. And uh, I, I got to go on to talk about uh, uh, the drug industry. And, and uh, there was a, a person who was a, 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 a person who tends to attack and write negative things about the industry named Dr. John Abramson. He was on the panel, it was he and I and Dr. Ross. And, and uh, I was too naive to ask what the segment of, was gonna be called. And I walked onto the stage and there was a big sign say, four secrets drug companies don't want you to know. Oh. <laughs> Uh, and that uh, that was quite quite the experience, uh, but I got to to see uh, and and the audience was also somewhat uh, 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 loaded uh, negatively. Uh, so that uh, at one point, the doctor asked stood in front of a group of thirty people and said, "Wow, uh, how many of you have ever experienced a drug side effects?" And they all stood up, everyone. Of course. Yeah. <laughs> of course. <laughs> like, oh, you but that led me to write my second book. 
uh, devalued and distrusted uh, kind of pharmaceutical industry restores broken image. And then, and then I also, at the time, uh, be, was writing, uh, a, I had a blog and it was picked up by Forbes.com. So I wrote there. And then as in the last seven, six or seven years, the uh, negativism toward the industry has focused more on drug pricing. Mm. And so that led me to write Pharma and Profits, Balancing Innovation, Medicine and uh, Drug Prices. Because, uh, and, and that's actually one of my major concerns still, the pressure on drug pricing. And uh, unfortunately, people don't necessarily understand all the issues involved in drug pricing and and, and you can only, uh, if you only hear the negative stuff, if you only hear Bernie Sanders taking people to uh, Canada uh, uh, to get their insulin, uh, people say this is a, a disaster and needs to be corrected. And, and by the way, the Inflation Reduction Act put a cap on insulin prices for everybody at $35, which is wonderful. Uh, and I think it's great. To, having said that, before the IRA, 75% of the people in this country were already paying less than $35 for their insulin because they had uh, a decent insurance uh, and, and it, was, it was naturally covered. Uh, people also don't realize that you can go, and I didn't believe this when I first heard it, uh, you can go to Walmart and without a prescription, buy insulin for twenty four eighty eight dollars a vial. Hmm. Uh, and you're looking at me like I'm crazy, but it turns out that's true. Uh, and, and so, but... But you can't. First of all, it's it's uh, it's it's not the very good insulin that is now sold. Uh, I'm going a little too much on insulin, but I'll, I'll say this. the ins insulin is not insulin. I'm sounding like uh, Rudy Giuliani. Truth isn't truth. Insulin that was discovered in the 20s and 30s uh, is insulin that was isolated from animals. The in so-called insulin now are modified insulins that the drug companies and you need a prescription to get these. Drug companies have gone in and made modifications to improve our nation. It's much better than regular insulin, safer to take, et cetera. So people shouldn't go to uh, Walmart to get their insulin unless they're under doctor's uh, uh, prescription, uh, doctor's uh, care, because uh, if you miss, miss dose, miss inject your insulin, you can have all sorts of problems. But in any case, all sorts of things like this are out there. And as a result, there's tremendous pressure on the industry and pricing. And, and, uh, and you know, it's, it's a a, a, a bipartisan issue. Both uh, Democrats and Republicans will say uh, uh, we've got to we've got to rein these uh, uh, drug companies in and 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 uh, get uh, these ridiculous high prices down. And I thought this would all change after the pandemic. That you know the only industry that could have saved us from the pandemic is the biopharmaceutical industry with companies like Pfizer and Moderna, but not only them. Dozens of companies, uh, if, if not a hundred companies, were all looking at ways to treat COVID uh, as a top priority. And some things worked, like uh, getting things like Paxlovid uh, and antibodies, uh, like Regeneron did. So some things came out very well. But the whole industry did, and there's no other. You couldn't do that in academic institutions. You, you couldn't do that at, at the NIH. Only the industry did that. And for a while. I'd say nine months to a year, Gallup polls and other polls show dramatic uh, improvement in how the industry was viewed by people. Uh, some of the highest numbers I've ever seen. And now it's eroded back down and it's coming back. Down. So why do I write? I try and give talks. And why do I, 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 I have the pleasure of speaking to people like you? It's basically to, to try and teach what the industry does, what's important, and how it's a necessary part of our, our whole uh, uh, health ecosystem. Yeah, I feel like I feel like it's a little it's a little duplicitous to to say that you know, hey, drug prices are too high, and then and then we have you know our regulators and the uh, you know the the people that are politicians with their their hand in their pocket, you know, to you know reaching reaching deeply into the coffers of you know the the drug you know prices themselves, and so you know I I think it's I think it it's a little. Um, disingenuous just to keep saying that, you know, Hey, look, the drug prices are too high. And then, you know, you accept, you know, a hundred thousand to $300,000 of, uh, you know, money from, you know, everybody from pharmaceutical warehousing all the way through to, you know, the, the, each of the lobbyists that are essentially involved in, in drug, you know, development as well. And so I, I sort of, you know, I agree with you. I think it's, you know, it's something that the public is just not aware of all of the different hands that touch a drug, you know, as it goes through. But also, you know, I kind of look at the other side of this, which is, 
you know, look, it takes it takes decades to research and then bring a drug to market back to your original point. Um, and I and I really think that, you know, it's one of those things that you have to have to work through. So. Um, so, yeah, it looks like we actually just uh, just lost John. Hopefully he'll join us back here in just a second. But, uh, um, yeah, I do think that that it's one of those things that, uh, you know, unfortunately, you know, we struggle with. So I see you you dropped and then came back. So um, I'm right back. But let me make one other point. Uh, and there's, there, there's a natural uh, built in price control and that's drugs going generic. So after you've been on the market for about a dozen years, suddenly the pr price drops down. And and so uh, uh, I talked about Lipitor earlier, the generic form is atorvastatin. And I, I'm a, a, a atorvastatin user and it costs literally pennies a day for a life-saving drug that uh, reduces heart attacks and strokes as all statins do. Uh, and that doesn't happen in any other part of the healthcare system. The, uh, uh, let's use uh, hip replacements as an example. Hip replacement technology is the same now as it was 40 years ago. Uh, and yet a hip replacement will cost uh, $40,000. Uh, and that's in the United States. It's, it's about a uh, quarter of that in Europe. Uh, and, and hip replacements, though, don't go generic. The prices for hip replacements to go up five to eight percent every year, such that uh, in the next ten years, hip replacement costs sixty, sixty-five thousand dollars. That doesn't happen with drugs. Drugs could drop right down, and so there's already a cost containment uh, 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 built into all of this that people don't appreciate. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Well, I'm gonna switch gears again uh, a little bit. So, um, given all of your experience and having served on multiple boards, what trends and innovations are you most excited about in life sciences? Boy, uh, I, I'll focus on uh, oncology. Uh, I think it's something that uh, touches everybody's life uh, in one way or another, friends, relatives, or even themselves. Uh, what I have seen in, in the last period of time is wonderful. We haven't cured cancer yet, but there isn't a cure for cancer per se, because cancer is a bunch of very different diseases with different drivers, uh, and even something like breast cancer, but all cancers are different. But uh, the work that's gone on in understanding what drives cancers, uh, what genetic defects occur, you can take a tumor and do a biopsy now and, and understand what the, the, the driving force for that tumor is. And, and now, uh, in some cases, you can go right off the shelf uh, for a drug that already exists that could treat that cancer. The breakthroughs in immuno-oncology are unbelievable. Uh, you know, people ask, why doesn't the immune system attack uh, cancers and, and, and tumors? And it turns out, the, and, and Merck and others have figured this out, and now there are some great drugs and more coming that unleash the immune system to treat these tumors, which I think are wonderful. There are a new uh, type of cancer drugs called ADCs, which help uh, guide, uh, to help reduce toxicity of cancer drugs by having uh, uh, the, the, uh, the, the, com the combination of the drug with, with another linker, take it right to the tumor so you're not exposing a healthy tissue to that. So that type of science is just un unbelievable and, and uh, it's great to see. Uh, there's great hope for AI. Uh, it remains to be seen how that will translate to uh, drug R&D. A Nobel Prize in chemistry yesterday was awarded, uh, awarded to great scientists who now have, have uh, can determine the shape of all proteins and the, the three-dimensional structure, which enables uh, all sorts of science to occur, including trying to design inhibitors or, or, or of those proteins, et cetera. All of them. You know, it, it used to take a year for a scientific lab to come up with one such protein structure. Now you got the whole library thing. So, you know, so much is going on, Don, so much is happening. Uh, uh, I, I'd like to think that my grandkids will have uh, much longer lives based on all of this happening. But again, I'm going to repeat myself for the millionth time, and that is it's the biopharmaceutical industry that will capitalize on these and come up with the new medications to treat uh, these diseases. And that's the, the beauty of, of that work. Yeah, I just, I mean, I, I, I agree. I agree with your statement. I just would like to, to maybe add a slight caveat. So, um, I mean, we're seeing some of the greatest challenges I feel like right now in the, in the venture capital markets in terms of, you know, people wanting to invest in, you know, the next generation of drugs. And so whenever you talk about, you know, licensing a compound from, 
Eli Lilly is one thing, um, but you know a lot of these smaller biotechs, you know, like PureTech and and others, are the ones who essentially you know do a lot of this initial work because um, you know oftentimes it's not attractive to the larger pharmaceutical companies until you know the the drug is more developed or more investigated and 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 I do feel like um, that starvation of the smaller companies. Uh, right now is going to lead a bit to a vacuum. Um, would love to hear your thoughts, you know, if you're seeing the same thing or if you, you know, are, are not. So investment in, in, in biotech tends to have a bit of an ebb and flow. Uh, we had a bit of a, a, a ebb in like 20, uh, 2010, 2012, around there or so. Uh, and then an explosion in, in the, the 20 teens uh which led to all sorts of of uh, new startups occurring you know any anybody with an idea that's a reasonable idea seeks to get funding a lot of times it comes to professors who decide they want to start their own company or or, or things of, of that nature uh or scientists may get together and start their, their own thing you depend on a venture capital uh and a venture capital uh, syndicate could invest say 40 50 maybe even 100 million dollars into this idea and that money can go a long way in the early stages. Uh, interestingly, discovery research is relatively cheap. It's when you get into uh, clinical studies that you really start driving up the cost and how you got to make bulk and you got to uh, get pay, uh, research uh, sites, hospital sites to do. So that becomes more expensive. Uh, but having said that, uh, uh, good, it's been a little bit tougher recently to get funds, but uh, that seems to be loosening uh, recently. And uh, a lot more startups seem to be getting funded. And to be honest, there are startups uh, forming almost on a daily basis in the biotech, mostly in the United States, but also globally. But having said that, uh, you know, a lot of these companies have one great idea and the idea doesn't pan out. And, and then they close, they shut her up. And then you, they, the scientists will move on to another company and, and uh, hopefully re repeat the process. So, but it's, uh, but that the startup area is, is a very important part of the, uh, uh, the drug discovery development uh, ecosystem. Uh, but what people, uh, uh, one, one more point to make, and as people don't appreciate the fact that even a big company like Pfizer, many years ago, while he had, and I'm talking about the 90s, uh, half of Pfizer products came from outside of Pfizer's own research labs. If you think about it, pretty arrogant to think that your own research labs can do everything and cover everything and be the smartest in everything. So you're often dependent upon, in fact, we would have a portion of our budget built, R&D budget built into bringing things from the outside in uh, to supplement our own ideas, but also to, to help drive a, a, a big company like Pfizer. And the same thing is true of Merck and Lilly and, and all of these companies to, uh, to be successful. So uh, important part of the ecosystem, as, as we said earlier, uh, some fringe ideas or early, very early ideas uh, as the microbiome uh, will get started in a, in a smaller uh, startup company, but eventually uh, get embraced by, by big pharma and help to benefit the whole world. Absolutely. So, when, when you look at, um, you know, kind of the, the field of drug discovery and development throughout your career, what do you consider as your most significant contribution? Oh, boy. Uh, you know, I, 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 I've heard some R&D heads uh, personally take credit uh, for all sorts of things. Uh, look, I, I, uh, this is a, a team effort. I was fortunate enough to help lead the team a big team in those days. We must have had about 12,000 people globally in, in all of R&D. Uh, I'm pleased with Pfizer they came up with uh, during my tenure of uh, drugs to treat uh, uh, neuroscience diseases, cancer, AIDS, smoking cessation. Uh, that's, that's all terrific. Uh, I'm glad I didn't get in the way of anybody trying to do this. I hope I, I was able to give guidance to, uh, to, to uh, helping people be successful and provide the necessary resourcing along the way. But you, you talk about teams, boy, it, it, we would, we would uh, after a drug got approved, uh, we would try and take a picture of everybody who was involved. And we'd have to go on the roof of the research building, which was about a couple of hundred people outside the, the, the labs. And we, we take that uh, picture because it's an unbelievable. And, and people make contributions all along the way. It's not just the guy who came up with the woman who came up with the idea of, uh, of a certain type of drug useful to treat a certain disease. It's 
who formulates the drugs that can get in? Who comes up with the breakthrough in synthesizing the drugs that we can make it in bulk? Who comes up with the clever clinical trial and a new creative clinical trial that will uh, uh, show the drug is efficacious? So it's an unbelievable uh, uh, group of people uh, that I was really proud to be associated with. Yeah, absolutely. So um, what do you believe are the, the key factors in fostering a culture of innovation in life sciences? Boy, I, you know, if you can bottle that, <laughs> you, can, you can make a hell of a lot of money. Uh, I, I think uh, you try and hire great scientists. Uh, you try and give them uh, enough freedom to pursue their ideas within a certain context. So, you know, I, I once had a fellow come to me and say, you know what, I'll, if you can cut my salary in half and let me work on anything I want, I'd be happy. I said, that's not our culture. Uh, our, our organization uh, Pfizer Inc. is depending on us to come up with new products and products that they feel that they can make a, enough of a commercial return in order to keep this whole enterprise of, a, at the time, 100,000 people running, uh, as well as benefiting mankind. So so hire, having great people, give them a certain degree of freedom within the context of what you're trying to do uh, and provide try to provide as much guidance as possible along the way. Now, projects don't run forever. And so one of the challenges I had was how long do you give a program? Uh, if, if the, com you know, sometimes you, you're in something for three years and the team hasn't come up with a compound yet to test the hypothesis, you sort of like, well, how much more do we do? If it still looks like a viable target and they still have some good ideas, maybe a little bit longer, but at some point you pull the plug. And that's a hard thing for any, anybody to do. And that's a hard stuff. But nevertheless, Provide the resources, provide the opportunity, have really smart people, get them interacting. I, I think uh, we're keys uh, in our organization. Yeah, I just I, I can remember from some of the organizations that I was in, you know, we would have these big R&D projects where we spent, you know, millions or tens of millions of dollars, you know, trying to, to drag something over the finish line. And the, the, the answer from the team was always we're close, we're close. Um, but then, you know, you, you have to eventually look at something and just say, you know, OK, look, this thing's not going to make it's not going to make it, at least not here. Um, and so, you know, sorry, but, you know, it, it is yeah. time to end the project, which is a tough, a tough um, answer. For, I feel like for any leader to deliver. Um, and, and I would say in my career, I mean, for for big projects like that, where there's, there's a lot of spend, um, I probably only saw a handful of them. Right. So yeah. <laughs> not very many. Yeah. Uh, it still hurts. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. So, John, what inspires you? Oh, boy. Uh, I would say the dedication that people will bring to their work. Uh, during the pandemic, uh, as an example, uh, I was uh, I was no longer at Pfizer, but uh, obviously I, I still live in the Pfizer community here in Southeast Connecticut. And uh, I did have occasion to visit the, the research labs they now have in Cambridge, Massachusetts. And uh, I was shocked to learn that when the pandemic broke, they closed the labs for about two weeks and then uh, they went back to work in the lab. So uh, they, they, uh, uh, they went to literally shift work so that there weren't a lot of people in the labs at the same time. Now, obviously, they wore all masks and protective gear. They set up uh, uh, plexiglass shields uh, in, 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 at laboratory benches so that people would be working and not exposing others. But they knew the importance of what they were doing and went back uh, uh, to work uh, immediately to try and solve uh, the, the, the challenges for coming up with both uh, mRNA vaccine and also uh, Paxlovid, which eventually became important as well. Uh, and that, that's just the, the pandemic example. But there's, you know, people uh, dedicated, work hard. Uh, you know, it's not unusual to go by research labs uh, late at night and there's somebody there working up an experiment, a key experiment that they're doing because they know they want to get it tested uh, in, in the, their animal model or running animal tests, knowing that uh, this could be a really important compound. Now, people, people take this mission really, really seriously. And it, it's hard and it's frustrating. You know, when one in 10 compounds end up uh, that you put into development, come out the other side, I mean, you, you have to deal with <laughs> a lot of a failure along the way. And these people are resilient. They get back on the horse and they, they go back to work. Uh, they're terrific, and their work isn't isn't really appreciated, unfortunately, either. But they're they're wonderful. That that always inspired me. Absolutely. 
What concerns you? Oh, what we talked about earlier, uh, uh, the, the lack of appreciation of what the biopharmaceutical industry does, the lack of appreciation. Uh, for the importance of the biopharmaceutical industry, uh, uh, to, not just to the economy, but to the health of people along the way. We're on the verge of, of you know, uh, breakthroughs seem to be occurring all the time, but boy, the more downward pressure on, on uh, uh, res- uh, funding uh, of research will kill us. So people don't appreciate this. The, the fi- biopharmaceutical industry invests 25% of top line revenues, not profits, top line revenues into R&D. So as pressure is being put on, you know, the, the, both parties are very excited that uh, uh, you now have the Inflation Reduction Act, which is which is now negotiating drug prices. Uh, and I get it. Eighty some odd percent of the country wanted uh, uh, those kind of guidelines. So that's happening. Uh, but they don't uh, realize that uh, uh, as a result, the industry is going to be making tens of billions of dollars less. And that's tens of billions. That's billions less going into R&D. And that's unfortunate. And uh, that's, uh, but that's the reality that we now live. So that concerns me. Absolutely. Well, thank you for sharing that. Last question. What excites you? Oh, uh, <laughs> stage of my life now. I, I see all these things about uh, research going on and extending one's life, uh, lifetime. Uh, I, I don't think that's going to happen, and uh, certainly not in the near near future. Uh, I I, uh, I like seeing. Uh, the success of biopharm r and I, I enjoy uh, uh, being part of it in my small role with the biotech companies I'm working with. Uh, I, I like seeing the breakthroughs being made. Uh, and nice to know that for 45 years, I've been sort of on a part of all of this. So that's kind of nice to see. And I hope to continue uh, with, with companies uh, for the foreseeable future. Yeah, absolutely. An exciting future for sure. Well, thank you, John, for coming on the Life Science Success Podcast and for telling us all about Pure Tech Health. And uh, also so many great, great touch points in terms of your overall career and experience. So uh, thanks a lot for being here and thank you for sharing. It was my pleasure. Thank you. Thank you for listening to Life Science Success. For complete details about this podcast, including show notes, how to get in touch with guests, and more episodes, please visit www.lifesciencesuccess.com. If there's someone you'd like for us to invite to the show as a guest, please let me know by sending me a message at the podcast website. Please click subscribe on your favorite podcast app, share the podcast, or tell a friend about it. And last but not least, rate the podcast. Thank you again. Thank you again.